Hello and welcome to Baiju's classes. This lecture is in continuation to the previous lectures that we have had on government schemes. In the previous two lectures, we talked about Pradhan Mantri Jandan Yojana. We talked about much hype scheme of the government of India, Make in India. And in this lecture, we're going to talk about some other very important government of India schemes that have relevance to civil service examinations. So let's get started and we'll begin with the first important scheme of the government of India, which is Sansad Adarsh Gram Yojana. What is this scheme? This scheme is about the development of model villages. So Adarsh Grams, model villages are to be developed in different parts of the country. So what is the scheme all about? Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced this scheme wherein every member of the parliament has to adopt eight villages by 2024 and convert these villages into Adarsh Grams as model villages. So what is the catch here? The catch here is that by 2016, first model village will be developed. And by 2019, two more model villages will be developed by every member of the parliament. And in the period between 2019 and 2024, five more Adarsh Grams or model villages will be developed by each member of the parliament. That makes the total of eight model villages will be developed by every member of the parliament by the year 2024. So this is the scheme about the development of model villages in this country. What are the objectives of the scheme? The objectives are simple to develop model villages. Now, how to develop these model villages? Number of schemes on variety of different issues have been launched by successive central governments for the development of villages, for improving the infrastructure in villages. To effectively implement these schemes in the adopted villages will now be the task of the member of parliaments. Now, we all know that each village is facing unique problems. So depending upon the unique problems in a particular village, new initiatives are to be developed by these members of the parliament so that these villages are transformed into model villages. And when these villages will be transformed as model villages, then these villages will be used as a template for other villages to follow. So this is the objective of Sansad Adarsh Gram Yojana. But how are these villages going to be adopted? Which villages can a member of parliament adopt? Now, for example, I am the member of the Lok Sabha. Now, I can adopt any village in my constituency, provided that village is not my village, neither the village of my spouse. So this village in my constituency, I will adopt and develop this village as a model village. What if I'm the member of the Rajya Sabha? I can adopt any village in the state, in a state which sent me to Rajya Sabha, provided this village is neither my village nor the village of my spouse. So what if I'm the nominated member of the Rajya Sabha or the Lok Sabha? In that case, I can adopt any village in any part of the country. This is the reason why nominated member of the Rajya Sabha, Sachin Tendulkar, adopted a village in Andhra Pradesh to transform that village into a model village. Now, what is going to be the population of the villages that are to be adopted as part of the Sansad Adarsh Gram Yojana? If this village is located in the plains, then the population has to be in the range of 3,000 to 5,000 people. And if this village is in the hilly areas, then the population has to be 1,000 to 3,000 people. So that means under this Sansad Adarsh Gram Yojana, every member of the parliament, whether he belongs to Lok Sabha or Rajya Sabha, is the nominated member of the Rajya Sabha or the Lok Sabha, has to adopt villages to transform these villages as Adarsh Grams. Now what if I am the member of an urban constituency which has no villages? For example, I'm a member of 
Mumbai Lok Sabha constituency. Different eight constituencies in Mumbai, which are designated as urban constituencies. Then in that case, I can adopt a village in the neighboring rural constituency. This is what eight members of the parliament in Mumbai have done. They have adopted a rural village in the neighboring rural constituency. So this is how the identification of villages is to be done. What about funding? Whenever a new scheme is conceptualized, whenever a new scheme is initiated by the government, funds are earmarked for that scheme. But in this case, no new funds have been allocated to Sansad Adars Gram Yoshna. This is a very, very important point which might be asked in prelims examination. No new funds have been allocated to Sansad Adars Gram Yoshna, which is correct. So where will the funding come? For example, I have adopted a village. And in that village, rural housing is the problem. People do not have access to affordable housing. In that case, I will utilize the funds given under Indra Avas Yojana. Alternatively, if I have adopted a village where roads are a problem, where effective roads are a problem, then I will utilize the funds under Pradhan Mantri Grameen Sadak Yojana. Now, what if assets are to be created in the village I have adopted? Then the funds under Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act will be utilized. Also, Panchayati Raj institutions have their own funds. These funds are given by Central Finance Commission or State Finance Commission. Then these funds can also be utilized to transform this village into other grams or model villages. Also, corporate social responsibility funds can be utilized for transforming these villages. And also, funds under MP LAD scheme. That means Member of Parliament Local Area Development Scheme. Funds under this scheme can also be utilized for transforming these villages as other scrams. Now in UPSC examinations, sometimes we cannot expect direct questions on a particular scheme. So that means we cannot expect sometimes direct question on Sansad Adarsh Gram Yojana. So what can we expect? We can expect a question on MP led scheme. Because under MP led scheme, funds under this MP led scheme can be utilized for transforming a village as other grams. So we should be knowing something about MP led scheme. What is MP led scheme? Every member of the parliament since 1993, that means the scheme was initiated in the year 1993. Every member of the parliament, whether he belongs to Lok Sabha, whether he belongs to Rajya Sabha, whether he's a nominated member of the parliament, is given funds under this Member of Parliament Local Area Development Scheme. Funds to the tune of 5 crore rupees. And these 5 crore rupees per annum are to be spent by the Member of the Parliament for the development of his constituency. So this is what Member of Parliament Local Area Development Scheme is all about. Now, what can be the possible question that can be asked in civil service preliminary examination on this MP led scheme? Let's have a look at that. Consider the following questions regarding MP led scheme. Under MP lads, the role of the MP is limited to the recommendation of works. Sanctioning and executing the recommended work is the responsibility of the district authorities. One of the important statements that come out of this is that the role of an elected member of the parliament is not to execute the products. It's only to recommend the products to the district authorities. So ultimately, the project is to be executed. The project is to be implemented by the district collector under his supervision. The only task of the member of the parliament is to recommend works is to recommend to the district authorities that roads are in a dilapidated condition in such and such area. Please upgrade these roads. For that, I am allocating you the funds under MP led scheme. But the actual work is to be implemented, is to be completed by the district authorities. What is the second statement? The funds are to be spent only in the constituency of a member of parliament. Now we know that member of Parliament Local Area Development Scheme, under the scheme funds are allocated to a member of parliament 
to upgrade the facilities of his constituency. Now, can a member of parliament utilize the funds under MP led scheme for the development of a constituency other than his or her constituency? Yes, it can be done. How much money can be spent? Not exceeding 10 lakh rupees. So, money to the tune of 10 lakh rupees can be spent in constructing of assets in a constituency other than the constituency of a member of the parliament. For example, there is a natural calamity. There was a natural calamity on Uttarakhand. And a number of members of parliaments, what they did, they diverted some of their money under MP LAD scheme to the construction of assets in Uttarakhand. So this can be done. So under MP LAD scheme, funds not exceeding 10 lakh rupees can be transferred to another constituency for the development of assets in that particular constituency, even if the constituency is not of that particular member. So this is what sort of questions can be asked under the ambit of Sansad Adars Gram Yojana. We talked about what is the objective of Sansad Adars Gram Yojana? How can the villages to be adopted be identified? What is the funding pattern? And a possible question that can be asked in civil service examinations. So this was about one government of India scheme, Sansad Adarsh Gram Yojana. Now students, in the union budget 2015-2016, a very important announcement was made by Finance Minister Mr. Arun Jaitley, in which he announced two insurance and one pension scheme which he rightly remarked as transition from Jandan to Jan Suraksha. That means from financial inclusion to financial security. These two insurance and one pension scheme are part of Pradhan Mantri Jandan Yojana, providing insurance cover and pension benefits to underprivileged and poor sections of the society. Now in the second part of this lecture, we'll talk about these two insurance schemes and one pension scheme. Let's first talk about the pension scheme of the government of India launched very recently, which makes it very important from preliminary examination point of view in UPSC civil service examinations. The first scheme, Atal Pension Yojana. What is Atal Pension Yojana? This is a universal social security scheme of the government of India. And this is open to all Indians who have a savings bank account. Now, when I say all Indians, this is to be read very exclusively that this is a scheme open to all Indians. But the primary focus of Atal Pension Yojana will be the members of the unorganized sector. The primary focus under this scheme will be the members of the unorganized sector who want to join national pension system and who are not covered under any other statutory social security scheme. So one thing to be noted here is that this is open to all Indians, but the primary focus will be on the workers or the citizens belonging to the unorganized sector. What are the eligibility conditions? Anyone between the age group of 18 to 40 years is eligible to subscribe to this Atal Pension Yojana. And pension will be received after an individual completes 60 years of age. So that means from 18 years to 60 years, one has to pay the premium to the government. Depending upon the contributions that you make, you may well receive pension to the tune of 1000 rupees per month, 2000 per month, 3000 per month, 4000 per month or 5000 per month, depending upon the contributions that you make. So this is a scheme open to all Indians in the age group of 18 to 40 years you have to contribute a fixed sum as your contributions under the scheme. And depending upon your contributions, you will receive pension after the attainment of 60 years of age. But the government came up with a very important incentive to those who subscribe to Atal Pension Yojana. The government said that anyone who wish to join Atal Pension Yojana before 31st of December 2015, and who is not an income tax payer. In that case, the government of India will contribute 50% of the contributions under this Atal Pension Yojana. So this is one incentive that the government has provided. So what is going to be the minimum time frame 
for contributing under this atal pension scheme for example i join at the age of 40 so from the age of 40 to 60 years that means 20 years for 20 years i have to contribute under the scheme so minimum contribution is 20 years so for 20 years minimum i have to contribute under the scheme so that i become eligible for pension after i attain the age of 60 years since this is a very important government of india scheme we might well expect a question on atal pension yojana in preliminary examination to be held on 23rd of august 2015 so for that let's have a quick list of the quick facts under atal pension yojana as i said the focus of atal pension yojana is on the unorganized sector workers although it's open to all indians who do not pay income tax but the primary focus is on the workers of unorganized sector number second there is auto debit facility that you might be given a statement in prelims examination auto debit facility is available under atal pension yojana just to make sure that you do not feel confused after reading that statement i'll tell you that auto debit facility is provided in atal pension yojana what is this facility for example i have a savings bank account and i have to contribute to atal pension yojana because i am a subscriber of atal pension yojana then automatically contributions will be deducted from my savings bank account every year for contributions under atal pension yojana that means for this reason you have to maintain a sufficient balance in your savings bank account otherwise penalties will be applied to you so this is another feature and third aadhar would be the primary know your customer document now whenever you read the statement you might be confused because of conflicting interpretations of aadhar by the government and by the supreme court the supreme court has ruled that aadhar should not be made compulsory so if this statement is asked in civil service examination you might well turn to the supreme court decision in this case and mark this option as incorrect but this option is correct that means the government has said that aadhar card will be used as a primary kyc document and the fourth important point is that the scheme atal pension yojana will be administered by pension fund regulatory and development authority now all the contributions under atal pension yojana will be utilized by the pension funds which are approved by pension fund regulatory and development authority now there is an important concept here atal pension yojana is a pension scheme launched by the government of india there was a similar scheme launched by the government of india called swava lamban scheme what will happen to this scheme what is the eligibility criteria to subscribe under atal pension yojana 18 to 40 years now those subscribers of swala labam scheme who are in the age group of 18 to 40 years will be automatically migrated to atal pension yojana so there will be automatic migration now what if one subscriber of swava labam scheme exceeds the age group of 40 years in that case he has two options one he can terminate the scheme and in that case he will be repaid all the contributions that he has made under swala lamban scheme will be reimbursed to him or in another case he can continue with the swala lamban scheme and enjoy the pensionary benefits when he or she will attain the age of 60 years so this is what will happen to another pension scheme which was launched by the government of india which the current government has said has not reaped in the benefits to the tune that it was meant for so this is what will happen to the existing pension scheme before we began discussion on atal pension yojana i said that the primary focus of the scheme will be the workers of the unorganized sector now from civil service examinations point of view we need to have sufficient knowledge about which sectors which occupations which people are categorized as members of the unorganized sector the ministry of labor 
has categorized members of the unorganized sector into four categories depending upon number one their occupation under this category small and marginal farmers landless laborers bd rolling agents workers in the stone quarries even weavers artisans all these depending upon their occupation are categorized as the workers of unorganized sector so this was one categorization on the basis of occupation second categorization on the nature of employment now people from bihar go and work in the farms of punjab and haryana or sugarcane farms of uttar pradesh they are casual workers manual workers who have no job security also bonded laborers contract laborers depending upon the nature of their employment they are categorized as members of the unorganized sector third categorization specially distressed category these people are also socially ostracized for example scavengers for example those people who load materials into trucks unload the material of the trucks those who carry loads on their heads for example coolies at railway stations these are also members of the unorganized sector fourth categorization service category barbers midwives domestic workers fishermen fisher women all these who are not organized as trade union movements who do not have entry into various trade unions who do not have a say in the trade union movement of this country all these are categorized as the members of the unorganized sector so because this atal pension yojana is specifically focused targeted at the unorganized sector we should have sufficient knowledge about which are the constituents of this unorganized sector so this was about atal pension yojana what are the eligibility conditions when and how pension will be reimbursed to the subscribers of the scheme and other related issues we talked about in this lecture let's talk about the other two important insurance schemes provided by the government of india that is pradhan mantri jeevan jyoti bima yojana what is this scheme about for example if i am in the age group of 18 to 50 years and i have a savings bank account i will subscribe to pradhan mantri jeevan jyoti bima yojana and i will get an insurance cover of 2 lakh rupees this insurance scheme covers death due to any reason that means if a person dies his immediate family will get 2 lakh rupees as insurance cover this is a one year insurance scheme but it can be renewed any number of times So what is this Pradhan Mantri Jeevan Jyoti Bima Yojana? A very simple scheme. It's an insurance scheme. First, the eligibility is if you are in the age group of eighteen to fifty years. Now you pay the premium, you pay the subscription fee, and you will get insurance death cover to the tune of two lakh rupees for the death due to any reason. So this is the scheme Pradhan Mantri Jeevan Jyoti Bima Yojana, which will be administered by Life Insurance Corporation. another similar insurance scheme is pradhan mantri suraksha bima yojana this is also one year insurance scheme but this scheme also can be renewed any number of times in this case if you are in the age group of 18 to 70 years then you are eligible to subscribe to pradhan mantri suraksha bima yojana by paying a specific premium you will be entitled for insurance cover to the tune of 2 lakh rupees Are you confused between Pradhan Mantri Suraksha Bima Yojana and Pradhan Mantri Jeevan Jyoti Bima Yojana? Don't be confused. I have a table for you wherein I will distinguish between Pradhan Mantri Jeevan Jyoti Bima Yojana and Pradhan Mantri Suraksha Bima Yojana. Take a look at this graph. Pradhan Mantri Jeevan Jyoti Bima Yojana is between the age group of 18 to 50 years while Pradhan Mantri Suraksha Bima Yojana is for the people in the age group of 18 to 70 years pradhan mantri jeevan jyoti bima yojana covers death due to any reason but it does not cover disability whereas pradhan mantri suraksha bima yojana covers accidental death as well as disability for example if a person dies his immediate family will get 2 lakh rupees 
Alternatively, if a person suffers permanent disability, then the individual will get 2 lakh rupees. And if he suffers from partial disability, then he will get 1 lakh rupees. This facility is not provided under Pradhan Mantri Jeevan Jyoti Bhima Yojana. Pradhan Mantri Jeevan Jyoti Bhima Yojana only covers for death due to any reason. Whereas Pradhan Mantri Suraksha Bhima Yojana covers accidental death as well as partial or permanent disability. Other differentiation is Pradhan Mantri Jeevan Jyoti Bhima Yojana is administered by Life Insurance Corporation and Pradhan Mantri Suraksha Bhima Yojana is administered by state-owned general insurance companies. Another differentiation is this is a scheme under Life Insurance Security Program, Pradhan Mantri Jeevan Jyoti Bhima Yojana, whereas Pradhan Mantri Suraksha Bhima Yojana is a scheme under non-life insurance security scheme because it also covers disability factors. So this is the differentiation between Pradhan Mantri Jeevan Jyoti Bhima Yojana and Pradhan Mantri Suraksha Bhima Yojana. So what have we talked about in this lecture? First, we talked about Sansad Adarsh Gram Yojana. Then we talked about three important schemes of the government of India, which government of India talks about as a step from Jan Dhan to Jan Suraksha, from financial inclusion to financial security. Three important schemes. Two insurance schemes, Pradhan Mantri Jeevan Jyoti Bhima Yojana and Pradhan Mantri Suraksha Bhima Yojana and one pension scheme, Atal Pension Yojana. So these are the schemes that we talked about. Let's talk about the fifth important scheme that we are going to talk about in this lecture and that scheme is called Rashtriya Gokul Mission. Dear students, Cattle rearing has been an important traditional livestock activity in India and is closely linked with the agricultural economy. Now, if we look at the 18th livestock census report in India, India has about 199 million cattle in this country. That accounts to 14.5% of the total cattle in the world. Of these 199 million cattle, 83% are indigenous cattle. But that's not the problem. The problem is that about 80% of these indigenous cattle are nondescript. What do we mean by nondescript? That means those cattle who consume more fodder, but yield very few or very low quantity of milk and have no characteristic of their own. So what we talked about, we talked about 18th Livestock Census of India, which talks about that there are 199 million cattle in this country that accounts for 14.5 of the total cattle in the world. Of these, 83% are indigenous cattle. But the problem is that 80% of these indigenous cattle are nondescript. That means these are the cattle who consume more fodder, but yield very low quantity of milk and have a no characteristic of their own. But on the other hand, indigenous cattle are very robust and resilient. And they are very well suited for Indian conditions. They can withstand high temperatures. They can withstand low input of food for a longer period of time. So that is the reason why the indigenous cattle are to be protected through better farm management, through better nutrition facilities, so that these indigenous cattle are protected. Indigenous cattle play a very crucial role in national economy by supplying number one, drought animal power, by providing milk, the milch animals, by providing cow dung, which is used as an organic manure, and by providing cow urine, which also has some medicinal use. So this is the reason why we need to protect and promote these indigenous cattle. But there is another reason. Cross breeds, on the other hand, are very productive. But their ability to withstand harsh climatic conditions is very low. 
and they are also susceptible to tropical diseases as well this is the reason why we need to promote indigenous cattle and this is the reason why the development of indigenous cattle is warranted for this reason alone we have rashtriya gokul mission what are the objectives of this rashtriya gokul mission let's have a look at those the first objective is to undertake breed improvement program for indigenous cattle breeds to improve their genetic makeup and increase the stock now how this can be done for example we have indigenous dairy breeds in different parts of the country like we have sahiwal in punjab we have rathi and thar prakar in rajasthan we have gheer in gujarat if these breeds are selectively crossed with bulls then the offspring will be highly productive so this is one of the first objectives of rashtriya gokul mission that means the productivity of the indigenous cattle is to be enhanced by crossing them with various other breeds so that the offspring becomes highly productive this is one very important objective of rashtriya gokul mission second important objective is to enhance milk production to enhance milk production because if india is to be self sufficient in food it's self sufficient in milk then indigenous cattle are to be promoted protected and reared efficiently for example you can be asked in civil service mains examination in context of rashtriya gokul mission that in order to make india self sufficient the promotion protection and preservation of indigenous cattle is necessary prerequisite comment so for that we need to know why indigenous cattle needs to be promoted because they are more temperature resistant than the cross breeds and for other variety of reasons third important objective of rashtriya gokul mission is to upgrade these non descript cattle non descript cattle as i said who consume very high quantity of fodder but supply very low quantity of milk and do not have a characteristic of their own now how can you upgrade these non descript cattle by crossing them or by using elite indigenous breeds like gheer like red sindhi by crossing them with, with these elite indigenous breeds you can increase the productivity you can transform these non descript cattle into very productive ones so these are three important objectives of rashtriya gokul mission from civil service mains examination point of view i told you what sort of questions are expected from rashtriya gokul mission but since here we are talking about indigenous cattle we are talking about cross breeds we can also expect some questions in preliminary examinations let's have a look at that mock question that can be asked indigenous cattle are categorized as zebu and are characterized by the absence of a hump this is one statement that can be asked in civil service examinations but one of the important characteristics of these indigenous cattle is the presence of a hump so the presence of a hump distinguishes indigenous cattle from the cross breeds so this option is wrong the presence of a hump is a necessary thing in indigenous cattle and yes they are characterized as zebu so one part is correct the other part is wrong which makes this option wrong second statement various studies have been conducted over the past few years which say that increase in the global temperatures the climate change that is occurring on this planet will reduce the milk productivity of the animals and will drastically reduce the reproductive capability of the cattle the second statement which i have carefully drafted here is that the decline in the milk production and reproductive efficiency due to thermal stress will be highest in cross breed followed by buffaloes 
So whenever you will look at this statement, you will be blank because you have never heard of this. So this makes it very important statement from preliminary point of view. Because we are talking about Rashtriya Gokul Mission, but we need to have a sound, clear understanding of what are the characteristics of our indigenous cattle. So the characteristics of indigenous cattle are that even if there is increase in global temperatures, even in the presence of thermal stress, the indigenous cattle will be least affected. But on the other hand, due to thermal stress, decrease in milk productivity and decrease in reproductive efficiency will be highest in the crossbreeds followed by the buffaloes. But what is the question asking here? The question is asking, which of the above statements are not correct? Statements 2 and 3 are correct. First is not correct. So only one is the option that you have to tick. So this is what we talked about, Rashtriya Gokul mission. The objectives are clear, to promote indigenous cattle, to increase milk productivity, and to transform these indigenous cattle from nondescript ones to very productive ones. For that, we have a number of initiatives that we have talked about in this lecture, and we also talked about some of the mock questions that can be asked in civil service examinations. So my dear students, this was the lecture on government schemes in continuation to the previous two lectures that we have had, one on Pradhan Mantri Jandan Yojana, the second on Make in India. And in this lecture, we talked about two insurance and one pension scheme recently launched by the government of India, one scheme called Sansad Adarsh Gram Yojana, and another very, very important scheme, Rashtri Gokul Mission. You might not see Rashtri Gokul Mission mentioned many of times in the newspapers. This is the reason what makes it one of the most important and possible questions to be asked in civil service examinations. Thanks for watching.